welcome to the Ask Historians podcast. All right, welcome to the Ask Historians podcast. I'm Jennifer, or Ed History 101 on Ask Historians. And today I am absolutely thrilled to have the author of one of my favorite books about women in American history. Uh, and Linnea, if you want to go ahead and introduce yourself and who we'll be talking about today. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much for the invitation. I'm really honored to be here. Yeah, so I'm Lydia Moland. I teach at Colby College in Waterville, Maine. I am actually a philosopher, um, but I got interested in the subject of this biography, Lydia Mariah Child, after the 2016 election, when I thought that it was time for me to think seriously about my own history, my own country's history. I've usually done German philosophy, and I really wanted to turn to women. I wanted to find out what women had done in a moment of moral crisis in our country's history. I had a sort of vague memory that women had been important in the abolitionist movement. And I've usually studied 19th century philosophy and 19th century history of philosophy. So I thought, well, let me see what women were doing. And it, the other thing that I was really sure of at the beginning was that in order to fight something as evil and as entrenched as slavery in the United States, you would have to be thinking philosophically. You, you would have to be asking questions like, what is justice? What is truth? What is equality? Mm -hmm. And if you wanted to end something like slavery, you would have to be really good at making arguments. Um, and so I went into the Schlesinger Library for the History of Women at Radcliffe, and I asked them to help me locate someone who was a woman who was important in the history of abolition. And I came across Lydia Mariah Child. I was totally stunned by what I found. I couldn't believe that I hadn't heard of this woman before. Um, and we can talk about you know why it was so stunning because of all the things that she did. But but what I was most moved by was her ability to change her life when faced by a moral emergency in her country. So um, she converted to abolitionism in 1830 when she was a young adult. Um, she was already very famous at that point in her life. She'd been a successful novelist already. She'd been a successful children's author and editor. She was um, the author of a very uh, successful self-help book. She kind of pioneered the self-help genre in the United States. It was called The Frugal Housewife. Um, and it was a yeah, very popular cookbook, but also just domestic self-help book. Anyway, so by the time 1830 came around, I think she was the closest thing you could come to being a household name in the 19th century, beloved for her advice and her novelistic sympathies. Um, and then she became convinced that slavery was evil and had to be stopped. She spent about three years researching and writing a book that she published in 1833 called An Appeal in Favor of That Class of Americans called Africans. And it was a fire hose of denunciations of slavery. So she went from being sort of a novelist and a children's author to writing stridently in all of these male fields. So there's a chapter on history, a chapter on politics, a chapter on economics, a chapter on the moral and the intellectual characteristics of Africans. Um, and then there's a chapter about Northern complicity in slavery. So she was determined that Northerners not get too pleased with themselves just because there wasn't actually slavery in the North anymore. Um, and so she, the last chapter is very much a um, yeah, denunciation of Northerners complicity in this evil. Um, and as you can imagine, her readers were not amused by this. Um, they were happy to take kitchen advice from her. They did not want to be told that they were sustaining <laughs> one of the greatest evils in the history of the world. So she really lost her readership at that point. Her Many of her books went out of print. She essentially lost her income. 
but she spent the rest of her life dedicating whatever resources she still had to ending, not just to ending slavery, because she was always clear that if there wasn't an end to the prejudice that slavery had created, there would never be actual racial justice in the United States. That's a kind of big picture um, description of, of what happened to me when I discovered her and realized, and that's just the you know beginning of what she did, but it is the description of how she, I think, really allowed philosophical thinking and, and a clear-eyed understanding of slavery to change her life. So you um, talked about how she reinvented herself. And I'm wondering if you could kind of talk a little bit about her as a young person and as a child. So the cover of your book is Lydia, Mar we went in 2022 would say Maria, but in 1830, it was Mariah Child, um, A Radical American Life. And it looks as if you share the same name as <laughs> the woman that you studied. Could you share more about her reinvention and her name and how what that meant to her? Yes, thank you. So she was born Lydia Francis. Francis was her family name. Um, she, Lydia was a very popular name in the 19th century. And she had, you know, a, I think a grandmother and an aunt and later a mother-in-law and a sister-in-law and a niece and several friends all named Lydia. And one of them got on her bad side. She doesn't say which one, but later in her life, she says that someone had made the name Lydia distasteful to her. So later, uh, when, when she was a young adult, so she, I should back up for a second. She was um, born in 1802. Her father was a baker. Her, she was not an intellectual household. So it wasn't a kind of Margaret Fuller story where her father was you know, encouraging her to read books. On the contrary, he was very unhappy with her literary um, interests, but those interests were really sparked by an older brother who did love books and got as a hold of as many of them as he could. And he was five years older than she was. And I think he really enjoyed the role of being the kind of know-it-all older brother. And so he had her reading Shakespeare and Milton, you know, as a little kid, and that really sparked her intellect and made her want to, I think it made her want to explore the big questions of the world. Mm -hmm. So by the time she, so her mother died very early, she was sent to Maine to live with um, a sister and actually lived very close to where I teach in a place called Norwich Walk. And as part of her time in Maine, she, um, it went on a kind of spiritual quest and was trying to decide whether she really believed in the kind of Calvinism that she'd been raised in. And at a certain point, she decided that she wanted to be um, rebaptized. And as a part of that kind of spiritual quest and decision to um, to be baptized again, she decided to take a new name. So she added the middle name Mariah to her name. So it's, then she was known as Lydia Mariah Francis. But she wanted people to call her Mariah. She was very clear about that. She did not want to be called Lydia. From that point on, she almost always signed her name L period Mariah. And then later after she was married, child. So actually the first time I saw anything by her, it was a letter that was signed L. Mariah Child. So I didn't even know that she and I shared a name until somewhat later. Um, but so that that's so I, I think about her becoming Lydia Mariah Child, yeah, as a a result of a series of decisions that she made. One, a kind of spiritual decision, and then later the decision to marry a man named David Lee Child. Now, one of the things I love about your book, so if I could you know, if, if fuse upon you for a moment about your book, is A, I love your voice. I love how it is clearly written by a woman moving through 2022, and all of 22 is present in it, but at the same time, it's, it's, it's Mariah's story. So I love your voice, and I love the history, because I, I thought I understood the Missouri Compromise. But now I really get the Missouri Compromise. And the fact that you help your reader understand what it meant to be a Maine citizen, a white citizen in Maine at that time and the compromises. And I, 
that was fantastic. I absolutely love that. So, so dear listener, if you're thinking it's just about this one woman, no, it's also, it's a book of American history. Um, and one of the things I want to kind of revisit is I'm most familiar with reading texts by women like Catherine Beecher of the 1830s who used this very passive aggressive flowery kind of here's my goal but I'm going to kind of come around it this way from the side whereas Mariah's writing like you were saying is just so on point so where did she learn that where did she learn her voice when the white women around her were using this very flowery passive aggressive approach yeah that is a great question I would say a couple of things. One, again, I think this relationship with her brother, which was a a real intellectual companionship all the way through their lives. And, and he pushed her, she would, you know, write to him and say things like, I disagree with the way Milton describes women. And he would write back and say, you know, essentially, how dare you? (laughs) And she would have to defend herself to him in ways that I think made her uh, understand how to be direct and how to be persuasive. I also think she, she read so widely and she read a lot of philosophy and philosophers are not always great writers. <laughs> but they, they do tend to be, uh, you know, to lay out arguments and try to make more kind of declarative sentences rather than, as you say, the more flowery um, I love the characteristic of people like Beecher's passive aggressive in their <laughs> writing. Um, but the other influence that I would really point to would be people like David Walker, who published, um, who was a black man who published a series of appeals against um, slavery a couple of years before her conversion. And also Mariah Stewart, who was a black woman who also was writing in those early days. And she would have encountered both of them, as far as I know, first in William Lloyd Garrison's Liberator. So gotcha. I don't know that she knew either of them personally. She she well may have. Um, but William Lloyd Garrison's weekly newspaper, The Liberator, which was you know, a major abolitionist publication all the way through from the 1830s through the Civil War was was absolutely relentless in its rhetoric. So you might know that William Lloyd Garrison in his first issue of The Liberator, this abolitionist newspaper, you know, said, I will not retreat an inch. I will not compromise. And then he put in all caps and I will be heard. <laughs> And, and that was just his attitude all the way through was just to call a spade a spade, to go to the crux of an issue as fast as possible, and to make arguments that were very hard to refute. So I think she learned from him as well. Hmm. I, I do think, um, and this is another part of what I find so compelling about her story, she was not a combative person. Oh, William Lloyd Garrison really was like Garrison loved a good fight. (laughs) Um, Child's husband, David was also a natural fighter and child um, herself was, was entirely capable of a fight and, and got into them regularly her whole life, but she preferred a conciliatory approach. And you can read that in her appeal too. She's very direct. She's very hard nosed, but she's also humble. Mm. And she also is trying to model, I think a kind of what I sometimes call fierce humility. Like, like we we're getting this wrong. We have to get it right. What are we going to do to reform? And Garrison tended to be much more, you are getting it wrong. I am getting it right. Now let me help you see how stupid you have been. Um, and that for her was was sometimes a real point of pain. And it was sometimes, um, it later caused a real split between her and other Garrisonian abolitionists who ironically accused her of being too moderate. So here was someone who had really sacrificed her reputation and her finances, many friendships, certainly her social position in order to try to end slavery. Um, But because she preferred 
to try to meet people where they were. Um, she was essentially ousted from the movement as a moderate. And I, 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 I bring attention to that in a way because I think it so speaks to where we are today. Mm. That now we struggle so much with what's the right thing to do, quite frankly, morally speaking, if there are people who are advocating morally reprehensible positions. Is it best to be patient and to try to meet them where they are and give attention to their bad arguments and try to bring them along? Or at a certain point, is our moral duty just to say, that's it, we're not talking to you anymore, we won't compromise, we won't, um, we won't, I think, you know, we won't um, pander to your um, bad arguments. And I think Child herself was often willing to entertain those arguments as a way of trying to bring people along. But sometimes people, like, you know, Garrisonians, thought she did that too much. So that's a long way of saying, you know, I think her her kind of direct style came from early influences, but was something that she both developed as she went along and that sometimes she herself struggled with. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think what's one thing that's really kind of fascinating about your story with the book and the nature of the book is when we talk about being white women in 2022 and the nature of moral emergency, we can look to the past. And so on one hand, you know, we have the work around like the mothers of massive resistance. We have the work of, you know, the white women who stood up to protest segregation or desegregation and who made black children's lives very hard. And then on the other hand, we have women like Mariah Child or we have the Grimke sisters. And so the Grimke sisters are often held up as this model of what it looks like to be a, to use a modern phrase, an intersectional feminist. And I'm wondering if you could just spend a few minutes kind of talking about the relationship between um, child, and this is entirely for me, I just want to hear you talk about it, <laughs> between the Grimke sisters and child. Yeah, it's, it's a fascinating relationship. And yeah, so I'm sure many of your listeners know this, but the Grimke sisters were born in South Carolina into an, an enslaving family. So they their family enslaved people, and they um, repented of that and became um, ferocious opponents of slavery who came north and got to know William Lloyd Garrison and some of the other abolitionists and were just an incredible asset to the movement because they could speak from experience. So there were still many, I would say most northerners who at that point believed that slavery, you know, it was unfortunate. It was kind of a blight on the country. It was an economic complication. It was a political burden. But there wasn't really anything you could do about it. And probably it was not so bad. And, and really, maybe Africans were better treated here than they were. I mean, there were all kinds of just horrifically self-deceptive justifications for slavery. And the Grimke sisters arrived and essentially said, no, it is an atrocity. It is barbaric. It is sadistic. It is worse than you've ever imagined. Don't let anyone tell you otherwise. So they they arrived on the scene and immediately became allies with Child and another woman named Mariah Weston Chapman, um, who, as I like to say, was the Child and Chapman were the 19th century versions of frenemies. They were they were allies, but they also <laughs> were very different and, and ended up falling out with each other. Um, but anyway, so the Grimkeys arrived and what was, I think, most impactful for child about their arrival is that they could speak. They were both, um, but especially um, Angelica, just riveting speakers. And up until then, women had been um, speaking some in the abolitionist movement, but there was a general prohibition on women speaking in public. And that came from a you know passage in the Bible in which the Apostle Paul had apparently told women to um, stay silent. And so there, in many cases, there were people who just didn't think that women should get involved in politics at all, but certainly should not speak in 
public. And the Grimke sisters started to do it and do it so effectively that people started to get um, more anxious. And especially conservative clergy who were, the, the abolitionists needed them. They needed to have allies in the church. But um, but conservative clergy especially were unhappy with this. And so Angelina Grimke and her sister Sarah got sucked into a terrible schism in the abolitionist movement over this question. And Child herself never wanted to speak in public much. She was apparently a very good speaker, but um, for whatever reason, just didn't want to. But she uh, was 100% behind the Grimke's and their efforts to speak, and so ended up writing in their defense, in defense of their needing to speak. And there's this amazing passage in which she essentially says, you know, if your conscience tells you to speak, no one should get between you and your conscience. Um, so they they were allies in that fight. And then I'm afraid uh, very much in the, the schism that happened thereafter. So there was a meeting of the American Anti-Slavery Society in which um, half of the meeting walked out because they just refused to let Abby Kelly, who was another um, abolitionist, um, be voted onto the the board, essentially. Um, and it was an incredibly painful time in the abolitionist movement. And so Child's relationship with the Grimkeys was really forged in the crucible of that fight for women to be able to... Um, advocate for the end of slavery the way they felt they should. Um, and they stayed friends also for, uh, at the Grimke sisters essentially withdrew from organized abolitionism at, at that point um, and went on to fight slavery in other ways, but they, they stayed friends for all of their lives. And did, when, after that schism happened, where, did, what, did Child have to make a choice about what side to choose or who to align with? And, and what did she choose at that point? Yeah, she stayed with the Garrisonians 100%. Um, so she, and, you know, those those months were so painful for all of them because some of their best friends were just ripping each other to shreds in the press. And of course, all of the enemies of abolition were just thrilled about this, that this infighting was crippling the movement. What happened after that in Child's case is also very interesting because as a result of that split, the American Anti-Slavery Society decided that they wanted a newspaper to compete with their erstwhile <laughs> friends' um, newspaper, and they asked Child to move to New York City to edit this uh -huh. paper. So this, this was called the um, National Anti-Slavery Standard, and it was also a weekly newspaper. And Child was the first woman to edit anything like it in the United States. And it was a crushing responsibility. It meant paying attention to all of the congressional debates about slavery, all of the international news about slavery, all of the anti-slavery meetings, who was falling out with whom, who was have, speaking where, you know, when Frederick Douglass was getting thrown from a train for refusing to give up his seat, like any number of things. But what was hardest for her was that it was just another place where abolitionists were infighting. So yeah. the Quakers wanted her to say one thing and the Baptists wanted her to say another. And if one of them got published and the other one didn't, everybody would complain. Um, so she lasted in that job for about two years. At the end of her time there was when she really had the falling out with Garrisonians like Mariah Weston Chapman and Abby Kelly, who were just convinced that she was too moderate. And at to the end of those two years, she um, resigned from the National Anti-Slavery Standard and also stopped being involved in organized abolitionist movements. So she continued to agitate on her own, but um, didn't participate in meetings anymore. And that period launched a, about a decade of real depression for her. Mm -hmm. She really, um, I think, felt like the cause of her life had failed, and it looked like it had. I mean, abolitionists were in total disarray, and 
um, slavery was becoming more and more entrenched. Southern politicians were getting better and better at um, defending it and enshrining it and all of these terrible developments in the um, 1850s. Um, and, and Child was really sidelined for much of that. She didn't have a place to write. Her friends had abandoned her. She, her marriage was falling apart at that point. Um, and it, yeah, it took about 10 years of regrouping, cultivating other interests, developing other talents. And then in the 1850s, when things got going again, really culminating in John Brown's raid, um, she she reengaged in a very significant way. So I think in a way, part of what I find I learned from her story is just what it's like to try to sustain a commit, a moral commitment over decades and mm-hmm. over failures and over the loss of friends and over the, you know, pressures that this kind of activism puts on a marriage and in all of the ways in which it took its toll. I just drew a blank. Did she have any children? She did not. Yeah, they would have loved to have children. They they wanted children, and, and something didn't work. <laughs> we, we we don't know what, and and neither did they. But you know, occasionally she would say things like, "I know I can work better and more for the cause without the distraction of children." Um, but other times she was clearly very um, mournful not to have had any. And as she aged and you know, needed help. That was a real source of um, of loss for her as well. Now, at some point, we have to talk about the poem. So I okay. suppose I'll do it now. And for for now, we'll have the song stuck in everyone's head. If you're an English speaker and you're familiar with it, uh, Child also wrote "Over the River and Through the Woods." So yeah. I'm wondering if so. I do know that Child had played a very significant role in the rise of juvenile literature. That she was one of the first, probably the first to recognize that young people were readers unto themselves and they deserve to read things written for them that they would enjoy. Um, and her, 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 the first, was she the first periodicals for children? Juvenile literacy, was she first? Yeah, it, it sort of depends on how you count, you know, what counts as a periodical and what counts as first, but it was certainly one of the very first, very successful periodicals for children. Mm-hmm. Um, so yes, it was called the Juvenile Miscellany. And it was a wonderful, I mean, it feels very marketable even today. I have to say it's got games and poems and riddles and stories and there's nonfiction and there's you know, fiction. Um, interestingly, her nonfiction, she takes on both slavery and the treatment of Native Americans very early. So, you know, as you say, she not only had a very early sense that children and young people needed their own literature, but she also was very clear that they needed to know their country's history and they needed to face the injustices in their country. Mm -hmm. And and in her very early publications, she takes the line that most people were taking, which was that, yeah, slavery is unfortunate and it would be good if we got rid of it, but most Southerners are very gentle and gracious people and we shouldn't be too hard on them, and they'll probably give up slavery on their own at some point. And also, as, as regards Native Americans, she would say things like, um, you know, they're a noble people, they're a generous people, it's unfortunate that they've been so badly treated, but, you know, probably they are destined for extinction anyway, which is a terrible, terrible thing to say. It also counted as progressive <laughs> at the time, right? So at a time when Many people were just openly advocating genocide. She was saying, you know, absolutely, they have a right to exist. It's just unfortunate that they're probably destined for extinction. She reversed herself on both of those positions very shortly thereafter. Mm-hmm. And was it just, a, uh, again, a ferocious critic of the United States treatment of Native Americans before we go to Children's Literature, I do want to get in your praises. Um, I thought I understood the the way in which what made her first novel so remarkable. I mean, granted, she basically wrote the first interracial romance novel, uh, you know, written by an American woman, which I loved how she signed her, her work that yes. so many times. But the way you framed the ending in the choice, uh, you just completely like shifted my entire thinking. So we can see as readers of your book, 
how you're interpreting the end of her of her novel. So we'll go back to the poem and children in a second. But could you speak a little bit to what was so remarkable and so revolutionary about the novel, her first novel? Yeah, so it's called Habamuk or Hobamuk. I'm not quite sure how they would have pronounced it. Um, and it tells the story of a European settler community um, very early, coming on the Mayflower. And uh, the patriarch has a daughter named Mary, who's you know, pretty clearly a kind of stand in for child. She's spunky, she's rebellious, she's literary, she's passionate. And she's in love with someone that her father disapproves of. It's a complicated story, as many of these 19th century novels were. But she, um, she at one point thinks that her father has caused the death of this man. And at the same time, she had gotten to know a young Indian, a young Native American named Habamuk, who is clearly in love with her. And partly because she seems to have feelings for him and partly as a kind of revenge against her father, she runs away from home and marries him and lives with him and they have a child together. And so, yeah, it's an interracial marriage. They have a biracial child. Um, and then <laughs> again, as often happens in these 19th century novels, the original guy shows up. He is not dead. He's not died. Um, and Habermas sees that this is the way child depicts it. And by this, at this point, she's she's not married. I should call her Lydia Francis at this point. Um, she imagines Habermas deciding to renounce his claim to her and to their child, and he just disappears. And then she marries this other man, dissolves the previous marriage, I guess, and marries this other man, and they raise the child as their own. And again, this is written at a time when uh, people like James Fenimore Cooper were writing these incredibly violent kind of, you know, but the, the end of these novels is there are these huge wars and the, and the Native Americans have to be um, wiped out in order to keep the white settlers safe. Um, and Child was trying to show a different way by, by essentially saying that, you know, this is a noble and generous people and they're going to, they, we can um, play our part in what she thought was American destiny without massacring them, essentially. Now, that's the good news. The bad news is that she very clearly saw them that as an inferior um, people who needed to cede relevance to European settlers. And the best thing for them to do was just quietly to go away. And again, later she renounced those ideas. I, I think she remained an assimilationist in some ways her whole life. So she, she did continue to think that Native Americans especially would do best if they imitated European customs. Um, but she was, but but the book was radical insofar as she entertained the idea that there could be real love between a white woman and a Native American man, um, that there should be, that, that biracial children should be, you know, not, we should not be ashamed of, but care for and promote them. Um, and also that there, that any kind of violence against Native Americans was completely unjustified. And it's that renouncing part that I think is so optimistic for us as modern readers, that we can change our minds and we can say, I used to think this and now I think that. Um, so back to the poem. Back to the poem, yes. <laughs> back to the poem. <laughs> Was that written for children? What's the story of Over the River and Through the Woods? <laughs> yeah, well, she, so she was, um, before her turn to radical abolition, again, a well-known children's author. She was good at it. People recognized that. Once she became an abolitionist in the 1830s, she said things like, I don't think I could ever go back to writing children's literature. Life has just become too serious and weighty to me. But then in that period that I was describing just a bit ago, where she had had to withdraw from organized abolitionism because of all of this infighting and had lost several friendships and her marriage was falling apart, etc., she did go back to writing for children. And so it was in that phase of 
real dejection about the direction her country was taking and the direction the abolitionist movement was taking that she wrote another couple volumes called Flowers for Children. And they too are full of, you know, poems and stories and um, little anecdotes. Um, And that was where she apparently imagined and remembered her own childhood Thanksgiving. So she did live near a river and near some woods and her grandparents did live on the other side of that river. It wasn't very far away. So I think we, some, I, as a child had this image of like hours in the snow. Yeah, exactly. But it's not clear that that was true. But I, but yeah, she, they did as a, as a family go over the river and through the woods uh, to grandfather's house for Thanksgiving They were also, her father became a a fairly successful baker, and he was very determined to be generous to his community. So there were big feasts that included the people who picked berries for them and cut their wood for them and made the bakery possible. And those were clearly important formative memories for her. I do sometimes really wrestle with trying to bring these two sides of her together, someone who I mean, she wasn't just a, a a dedicated opponent of slavery. She was willing to go there in her descriptions of slavery in ways that were not considered acceptable in polite society. So she would describe rape. She would describe torture. She would describe family separations, all of the things that... Um, your average white northerner did not want to hear about and didn't think should come up in polite company. And I should say, I said she described rapes. That's a little too much, but she did. She was very clear about the sexual assault that Mm -hmm. and rape that enslaved women were routinely subjected to. She would sometimes refer to it sort of obliquely, but she wanted people to be aware of it. Some of what she wrote describing slavery, I find hard to read now. I mean, we're very accustomed to violence in the media and violence in our films. And um, if you watch, you know, for instance, any number of, of, of films that have been made about slavery recently, um, they can be very hard to watch. I still find her writing about slavery hard to read. Like that's how clear she was about describing the kind of awful physical grotesqueness of the sadism involved and then on the other hand she could do this over the river and through the woods and the cousin's cheeks are rosy in the cold and there are pies coming out of the oven um and I, I don't exactly know how to reconcile those except that she was a person who could see both sides of many issues and I I do think she thought I know she thought that if you appealed to people's better natures and their sense of love for each other and community, that that was an effective way to try to end things like slavery as well. Mm -hmm. So um, even Frederick Douglass in writing about her later would say things, he said something like, um, who knows how many people she won over by her gentler, happier, more sentimental examples of writing. Um, he specifically talked about something called Letters from New York, which was another thing she wrote um, that was very popular and not explicitly anti-slavery. I think one of the things you, when you talk about how, how you reconcile that, I think one of the things that you're definitely offering to the field is so often um, women in history are they're kind of torn, flattened. They're turned like this one dimensional, you know, she was a noun. But I think what you're really highlighting is that child, like so many other human beings are multifaceted and multidimensional and, and much more complicated than we tend to give them, tend to give them credit for. And I think that's just so incredibly powerful to be able to read how you wove all of her story together with all of American history. So we get a much, much fuller understanding. I think that's absolutely fantastic. Thank you. Yeah. But I do have to ask on the boring side of it, which I think is, I mean, it's cool. It's a great poem. Fine. Whatever. How did it get turned into a song? That I do not know. I have to admit that I just, <laughs> I have to admit that I, I get that song stuck in my head so often because I'm just writing about her um, that I really should, but I do not know. And of course, part of what's ironic is that 
even though I don't know that there's a school child in the country who doesn't know that song, um, people usually don't know that it's by her. And even if they know that it's by her, they have no idea who she was. <laughs> so you're right. She, and, and it's a, it's a sorrow to me in a lot of, I, I think she would, let me put it this way. The irony that she is known for that sentimental poem and not for her radical attacks on American racism, that irony would not have been lost on her. Yeah. She would not have been surprised that, yes. you know, everything, all of the, blood, sweat, and tears that she poured into trying to convince Americans to look at the evil underbelly of what was making us, a you know, an economically great country, that that, that was just forgotten. Yeah. And everybody I, sings the poem. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> on that note of ironies, it wouldn't be lost on her. This is kind of a deep cut, but, and my apologies for not giving you a heads up on this one, but um, there's a woman I know, um, Caroline Gilman, who wrote a uh, juvenile magazine called Rosebud that was written for the children of enslavers in the American South. My understanding is she was inspired by Child. Hmm. Did Child know what Gilman was doing? Did that ever hit her radar? Do we know? That I do not know. Yeah, that sounds like something I should uh, look into. But yeah, I, I don't know how that influence continued. I mean, I will say, and this is a slightly different topic, but um, one of the other things that she, I think, doesn't get enough attention for, for good and for bad, honestly, is um, a book that she edited towards the end of the war called The Freedman's Book. And I, I bring that up here because that was explicitly a book to try to help newly emancipated children. So the people that those enslaved enslavers had enslaved who were now emancipated learn to read and more importantly learn about their society and their and the history of black people. And this was something that I I consider so profound really mm -hmm. that so child at the end of the war wanted to help educate newly emancipated people. She wanted to do that by making them aware that there were Black politicians, artists, military leaders, scientists, um, and that there had been people like Harriet Jacobs and Frederick Douglass and Francis Ellen Watkins Harper who had protested, right? So, so already this narrative was starting that enslaved people had just been helpless or docile or whatever. And she wanted to show these newly emancipated people that that was not true, that they came from a, that they had a heritage of black people advocating for justice and also being leaders in other realms. I say that it's a mixed history in part because she also used that book to try to convince these, what were called freedmen, that their duty now was to forgive their enslavers immediately and never to be angry and never to protest and never to try to get any compensation for just the labor that they had lost, um, but instead be conciliatory and forgiving. I think that was an incredible burden to inflict on newly emancipated Americans and many times it did not work, right? She, and I think, well, I know she knew that that was not going to work in many cases. She knew that black people who acted respectable and got educated and, you know, looked like what white people wanted them, wanted quote unquote civilized people to look like. She mm -hmm. knew that that would enrage certain white people, far from making them think, okay, well, maybe prejudice isn't a good thing. On the contrary, it would enrage them. She, she knew that. She was on record saying that in other places. And nevertheless, she took this opportunity essentially to tell them the opposite. And to me, that, that's one of the lessons as a white person I feel like I have learned from this book is that it's important for people like me not to wring our hands about racial injustice on the one hand and then try to convince people suffering from it 
that it somehow doesn't exist. Yeah. So that was a very um, <laughs> long and not entirely related, but it just, your question reminded me of that kind of um, sure. initiative that she was involved in in other contexts. Yeah, and it speaks to, again, that we have choices that we can make as white women in 2022. We can, there's choices we can make about the moral emergency and we can choose to publish Rosebud and support, you know, the children of enslavers, or we can, you know, we can consider the path that child followed. Yes. Uh, she's just such a cool, I mean, it sounds, it's ridiculous to fan, like just like have a, do fan service over an actual living person who lived before us, but she really was quite a remarkable human being. And I'm so glad that you wrote your book and I'm so glad that it's out there because I really wish instead of Betsy Ross, it should be Lydia Mariah Child. Forget <laughs> Betsy Ross. No <laughs> about Lydia Mariah Child. <laughs> Yeah, and I do think if I could just say to her, her life intersected in fascinating ways with some of the most searing moments of the Civil War era. So she was best friends with Robert Gould Shaw's mother. And so Robert Gould Shaw, as your listeners probably know, led a troop, one of the first troops of Black soldiers um, in the Civil War, and he died in the in one of the battles that they fought. So learning about that through her, she was um, one of the people who converted Massachusetts Senator Charles Sumner to abolitionism. So when he was beaten unconscious on the Senate floor for his abolitionist beliefs, she was involved in that in a really interesting way. She edited Harriet Jacobs' memoir of enslavement. So she... And that's another very problematic chapter in Child's life. And she has come into a lot of criticism for the way she handled that. And I try to be really honest and soul searching about that in the book. Um, and it's also true that she helped Jacobs get this story of her enslavement out in a way that is absolutely priceless. Um, and I, I guess it reminds me a little bit because someone said to me early on, women don't read books about the Civil War. And I thought, I really would love that to change. Um, I would love, I, I obviously I want men, I want everyone to read this book. Um, but I do think that it's a way for women to see women reflected in these moments that are otherwise often just told, quite frankly, from a male perspective, a military perspective. Um, and the other big one is John Brown's raid, that she was very involved in the response to John Brown's raid and really triggered a kind of, as I sometimes say, 19th century equivalent of going viral around um, a response that she had to John Brown's raid. So that, that's a whole other story. It's all in the book. Um, but it is another moment where I think that, yeah, the, the range of things that she did and the kind of um, powerful writer and thinker that she was means that many of these historical moments just are illuminated in really interesting ways. And where do you see yourself going from here? Is there another woman who's caught your interest or are you heading back to philosophy? <laughs> there are a lot of women who have caught my interest. Um, I am co-editing at the moment a an Oxford companion, sorry, it's an Oxford handbook of women philosophers in the 19th century. And my co-editor, Alison Stone, and I are interpreting philosophy there very broadly. And that, that feels really important to me. Philosophy sometimes gets very narrowly yeah. defined. Usually when that happens, we exclude a lot of people um, who were thinking philosophically, including people of color. So um, that's one thing that I'm doing now, working on that edited volume. But there are women that I've discovered in, in doing that and in um, doing other research that have really compelling stories. So um, I, I haven't made any commitments yet, but I'm definitely thinking um, what we might want to talk about next. <laughs> nice. Oh, that is, that's wonderful. And there's a whole bunch of women in education history that I'd love to throw your way. Hey, have you heard Please. of so-and-so? Because she did some great stuff. Please. So, um, thank you so, so much for um, mm -hmm. having this conversation. I, I mean, this so much. I love the tone. I love the voice. I love the history. Uh, thank you so much for your time and for introducing Ask Historians to Lydia Mariah Child. Thank you. Thank you so much for the invitation and the wonderful conversation. You've been listening to the Ask Historians podcast.
please support us at patreon.com slash askhistorians. Find more history like this by following us on Twitter and Facebook, and by visiting us at askhistorians.reddit.com and ask hundreds of historians and enthusiasts anything you want to know about history. Thank you.